Hello, welcome to our second chapter. Uh, this will be the second lecture. This one will be two parts. Uh, I want to separate it into halves there. So uh, let's start this one with uh, what, how we always start. Um, it's hard to beat a person who never gives up. Uh, don't forget that. So what we want to do is always remind ourselves that every exam that I ever give will have questions from these objectives in it. Uh, that's how I'm going to base my exam. Uh, these are what the college says I should be teaching and testing on, so that's what I'm going to teach and test on. And it just makes it that easy uh, really to be able to go through and, uh, and set up a test that is the way I think it should be. So uh, what I want to make sure of here is that um, I let this thing time out, so I need to fix something real quick. Okay, it's working now. I just needed my to be able to my uh, little pad here to draw on. So, okay, so um, I'm not gonna sit and read them to you. I think that's just kind of insulting to sit and read something to you guys when you're capable of doing that your own. Let's explain it to you. Now, what we want to start off with to help you guys understand some of the big uh, things here and really grasp what's going on is first we want to take our senses and we want to break this down into two very basic groups, two types. There is general, and this is what we saw back at the very last chapter, uh, last material in AMP1, um, is things like pain, temperature, touch, pressure, vibration, proprioception. These were things that we saw that tell us general information about the world around us. Um, they don't have necessarily like special parts of the body that does it. They have special receptors like pain receptor, uh, nociceptor, uh, temperature receptors, thermoceptors, touch, tactile receptors such as pressure, uh, your lamellated corpuscles, your pacinian corpuscle. We called it vibration, has some very specialized proprioceptors, things like that. Uh, they are specialized receptors, but no specialized organ has those own. And what do I mean by that is special senses, a sense of smell, for example, is found only in the nose, and that's it. Vision is found only in the eye. Taste, only on the tongue and parts of the throat. Balance, only in the inner ear. Hearing, only in the inner ear. And there's no other places we find those areas. So they have very specialized uh, organs. They're specialized with specialized organs, specialized receptors that are found only in those areas. They're, they're unique to only those areas. Now those neurons tell us information about things going on inside and outside the body. But that's all what receptors are supposed to do. Uh, a pain receptor is telling me with its free nerve endings that there's a harmful stimulus. Uh, temperature telling me that there is a, a change in temperature, uh, especially hot. Uh, things like that. So, and it really depends upon how uh, intensely we stimulate those receptors tells me how rapidly, tells me how intense the pain is, how intense the sensation is. And that's something I talked about in AP1. Now, what we want to see is with the five special senses other than touch that we have, we have olfaction, which we can say is smell. You can smell the olfactory. There's gustation. Gustation, gustatory means taste. Vision, which is seeing, visual information. Equilibrium is balance. That would be like me being able to tell up from down, etc. And then five is hearing, which is me getting sounds, okay? Now, they're specialized, they're different from the ones we talked about, like Piscinian corpuscle, Ruffini corpuscle, lamellated corpuscle, tactile corpuscle, uh, Golgi tendon organs, that kind of stuff. Uh, they're different from those things. These are uh, all found only here, and that's it. You're not going to find an olfactory receptor in the esophagus, uh, but you can find uh, lamellated corpuscles throughout the entire body. So... All right, so let's start off first with olfaction. Now, olfaction is smell. Since, since a smell involves a special organ, it's called an olfactory organ. The olfactory organs, where would you find them? Well, if you were to go in the nasal cavity and go up the upper part, superior part of it, you would find the sense of smell. The olfactory organs are up there in the top part of the nose, nasal cavity. They're in this superior part of nasal cavity. Why? That's where the information that you, when you inhale through the nose, 
is going to get to. Now, this is why if you have a stuffed up nose, it's hard to smell. Now, also, to get this olfactory organ, there's two distinctive layers to it. Now, the first part is epithelial, and the other part's the underlying connective tissues. We were, uh, so the olfactory epithelium and lamina propria. Now, what is the olfactory epithelium? Well, this is the part that has your olfactory receptors in it. This is where the cells that you are going to use to determine what is that smell. Then there's going to be some supporting cells present, and then the stem cells to replace lost cells for smell. Now, since it covers the roof of the nasal cavity, this olfactory epithelium there up there has a lot of nerve uh, neurons in it, specialized sensory cells, olfactory receptor cells. So that means underneath that, you're going to have nerves, the nerves which are produced when these uh, receptors communicate uh, to a sensory neuron those sensory neurons produce the nerves. There's also a lot of blood vessels in the, in the nasal cavity. We probably know that if we've ever gotten a nosebleed. And there's areolar tissues up in there. And that is the lamina propria. Now, the lamina propria contains your olfactory glands, uh, where water uh, is absorbed here. Uh, normally, we, re we absorb some water, uh, but when it's really uh, uh, dry, we re absorb less water. And this is why our nose runs in the cold, because cold Cold air tends to be dry air. Also, our body physiologically uh, is doing that, but a lot of times the cold air hits our warm nasal cavity and it condenses, makes our nose run. That's why our mucus gets running when it's cold outside. Now, what we want to talk about this pigmented mucus, now we know that mucus is, can be clear or it can be green or um, yellowish or uh, maybe it's a little bit more orange when, when blood gets in there. So the pigments tell us some things about what's going on in our nose as well, sinus infections, things like that. But as you can see, the olfactory organs here is in the top part, upper part of the nasal cavity here, and the olfactory epithelium and its neuro on. So the olfactory epithelium has got the specialized cells here, the specialized neurons in blue, and then the supporting cells here in pink, and then the dividing cells, the active dividing uh, um, uh, basal cells. These can actually become new neurons. And what happens um, as these guys branch out, they go out into the nasal cavity and extend their dendrites out and acts like a big brush to collect odor molecules that you smell. For example, if you smell rose, the air from that goes up and along with that becomes molecules from that rose. Now, I hate to break it to you, but also, when you smell, when you go to the bathroom and somebody else has used it recently and it smells of feces, molecules of feces are actually coming in. Molecules that were on that feces are binding to the cells. Uh, molecules from that, they were on that person's feces who came prior to you, and now they're binding to proteins on neurons inside your nasal cavity. And then this olfactory gland is going to make mucus to help stick all that in there like flypaper. And it's going to catch these odorant molecules and grab them in there so you can chemically analyze that. Now, uh, these olfactory receptors, as I said, they bind to odorants. Now, our good friend G-protein makes a return. G-proteins, remember, what these guys are is they are proteins that are going to be found on the inside of this neuron. And when these molecules bind to it, think of this molecule that's binding to it. It was like you who is snuck out of your house to go see a concert your parents said you couldn't go see, but you snuck out of the house to go see it. Now you want to get into the house without your parents catching you, so you climb up to your bedroom window, and it's locked. The window's locked. So you tap on the glass, tap, 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 and little brother, little sister who's in the bedroom might let you in. They might be a cool little brother, little sister, and let you in. Or maybe they'll just let you stay out in the cold, or maybe they'll tell mom and dad on you and get you caught. Regardless of how that happens, the G protein on the receptors of these cells, that's what allows for the different actions. They are incredibly diverse in their action. And we talked a little bit about that when I talked about when I showed you a diagram of a muscarinic receptor. Now, 
They are sensitive to odorants, and these odorants bind to receptor proteins found on these neurons, and if it activates it or not, even if it does activate it, it doesn't mean you're going to get aware of it. You don't always send all information that gets here to the brain. After a while, you'll get used to it. Uh, some things you do very quickly, some things you don't. There are some things that are very important that we know about, and some things we just pretty much get used to very quickly. So it may go to the olfactory cortex. It may not. It really depends upon what, what, what it does, uh, what it is, and all the stuff that involved. Uh, do these neurons fire enough? Do they produce enough of a signal that says it's important? And then if it gets there, it's got to go through the olfactory nerve, cranial nerve number one, to get to the temporal lobe eventually so I can be aware of that I've smelt something and be consciously aware of what I smelt. So what basically happens is when a uh, molecule that you inhale comes in or an even gustatory stuff because like when food goes over your tongue, it washes over the tongue and vaporizes and it goes up into the nasal cavity and those chemicals can stimulate very frequently these neurons. The potentials and how often it does this uh, begins to show me uh, uh, information. It's basically taking a chemical, binding it to the dendrites of an olfactory neuron, and then sending that information to the central nervous system to let me be aware of the fact that a certain chemical of a certain structure has bound. Now, that's all well and good. And you think about that. Uh, this is a very common thing that happens. There are some smells out there for some people are pleasant and for others are not. Uh, case in point, um, if I'm out driving in the country, I grew up in the country. I grew up in a place called Possum Trot Ridge. And when I drive by farms and smell cow manure, my wife will usually go, ew, yeah, she kind of covers her nose, doesn't like the smell. And I kind of find it as a pleasant smell. I grew up in the country. I grew up around animals. We raised pigs. So I'm kind of used to that smell. And I actually kind of find it pleasant. Or, uh, but my wife doesn't. Um, and you may also kind of get that idea that for some people when they smell fresh cut grass, it might bring up strong memories to them. It's just the chemical composition of what grass is releasing is a stimulus to stimulate these things. But in our mind, we interpret them as positive or negative things based on our experiences, which is very fascinating. And I just like to give those extra things. Remember, if it's not in my notes, you're not going to get tested on it. But I always like to kind of go a little above and beyond because I can. So what's going to happen is an odor molecule will bind to a receptor and activate a G protein. And when that does, it sets a cascade of events on the inside of this cell to stimulate it to let me know that the odorant is bound. Now, for every odorant, the receptor proteins are unique for different molecules. So if one odorant binds, you might not be able to smell it. But when they bind to these proteins, odorant binding proteins, so that actually means when you smell fecal matter in the public bathroom, it is a molecule from feces has made it through the air, gotten into your nasal cavity, made it to the olfactory organ, found a receptor neuron, bound to a protein chemically, and activated your, your, uh, your, your ability to do this. Now, um, usually, uh, uh, if it's either extremely water-soluble or lipid-soluble, are the things most easily to get in there, things that are because of the mucus and things of the cell membrane's composition, it's going to be the things that are kind of the most polar and nonpolar. Um, so uh, these things have the strongest smells, are very small, with uh, lots of solubility, either in water or in lipids. Not going to test you on that. It's just some things I want to talk about. That There's lots of odorants that are very strong, some that are not, but the intensity really comes from how often you stimulate a receptor. Now, Gustation is much like olfaction. It's the chemical composition of a material, but instead of odorants, things going through the air, it is going to be food and drink. 
food and fluid. Now, when you eat food, gustation tells me what it's made of. Now, it's chemically analyzing that. When you eat mom's chicken pot pie, it is chemically analyzing what's there. It's not telling you that it's good. Now, that all comes from your mind, what you think of when you think of chicken pot pie. Uh, and, and it's it's a very interesting thing there, too. I have a very strong interest in this. So I'm sorry that sometimes I will just do that to add some extra flavor to my lectures there. Now, taste, gustatory receptors, instead of being in the nose, they are on the tongue, mostly on the tongue. There are some in the pharynx and some in the larynx. But the most important ones that we need to know about are the ones on the tongue. Now, these guys are going to be taste receptors come together with epithelial cells and make taste buds. Uh, what is a taste bud? Well, taste buds, essentially put, um, if I go in here with my blue, and let's say I've got this little guy here who is a uh, gustatory cell, and I've got another gustatory cell here, another gustatory cell here these are the cells with taste and they got all these microvilli on them and they're clustered up here they're stuck in here it's very specialized neurons and then inside of here uh let me see if i've got a color that i want to use for this let's use that is there some cells <clears throat> my uh, air server disconnected uh it lost the amount of the Wi-Fi was too, too weak. Let's see if I can get it back. Nope. Uh, one second, I'll pause if I can get that back. Okay, it's back. It could take a little bit to get this guy to work again. It's very slow. Uh, the Wi-Fi here is, can, can be kind of weak. And um, uh, everything in mine. Um, there we go. Keeps falling or something. Always. So what we want to do, and then you're going to have all these little cells here that hold that together. And these clusters here kind of hold them together. I'm going to close that out, uh, minimize that. It is not working for me right now. Uh, hopefully I can get this to work. So what about taste buds? Uh, right here is a taste bud. The little taste hairs that are found on the gustatory receptors. Then they have the cells inside that help support them. And we're going to talk about that. Now, what we want to do is make sure that we understand that the taste buds are collections of taste receptor and special epithelial cells. Now, the taste buds then get packed into what is called lingual papilla. So, now one type of papilla out there has no taste buds in it. And these are called filiform. Filiform, F for filiform, F for friction. Filiform, filamentous, friction. They are for friction. They are what is used to move food. For example, when you lick a sucker or a popsicle and you wear it down by melting and rubbing pieces of it off, that's your filiform. They give friction. They help manipulate and move food around, but they have no taste to them. If you've ever seen a cat's tongue, that is some extreme filiform papilla there. Fungiform, which look like mushrooms, have five taste buds each. Five fungiform. The fungiform five. Five taste buds for every fungiform. About. Is that perfect number? No, but about five. It wouldn't have 200. It might have six, seven, eight, four. But it's not going to have 300, okay? It's going to have about five, close to five. Valate, or called circumvalate, have about 100 taste buds each. And they are found at the back of the tongue before things go into the uh, throat to be swallowed, called the valate uh, papilla, uh, form a V-shape at the back of the tongue. There are 12 of them, six on each side. Then there's the foliate on the lateral margins. Now, they heavily uh, vary in numbers of taste buds, so we're not putting them here. 
So you can actually see the foliate who are heavily folded, the fungal form like a mushroom, the filiform uh, who have your filaments on them. They're very frictiony. They don't taste anything, but they can feel uh, your fungiform five. Uh, and then, like I said, it is a highly variable here. There will be about 100 taste buds each uh, when you wrap around this thing. Uh, and they're down here. So they wrap all the way around, and food gets down in these crevices. So that's why when you taste certain foods, like if you go to a wine tasting, you have to let it sit on the mouth. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, who go here to the back. Now, there are oftentimes back in the back, there's pharyngeal, but a taste bud basically is something like this, where our gustatory receptors, a very specialized epithelial cells, uh, come in with taste hairs and molecules uh, from food as they disassociate in the water of our mouth, uh, ionize, they will wash over this, the chemicals will be dissolved by enzymes in the, oral, in the mouth, and they'll bind to this and can stimulate it and begin to tell you the chemical composition. Now that doesn't tell you that that's mom's chicken pot pie. It doesn't tell you that's mom's spaghetti or grandma's turkey. Uh, the food, uh, it just says that's what it's made of. Now that, that very particular taste sensation that you have is, is unique because in the mind that's mom's spaghetti and nothing can taste like mom's spaghetti and any other kind of thing. It's kind of interesting is because in the, the mind influences so much of how we taste things. If you've ever noticed that when you eat and when you make a sandwich for yourself, it doesn't taste as good as when somebody else makes it for you. Well, there's actually a good reason for that is that you have um, what is referred to as uh, you, pr you mentally taste it. You're tasting it, anticipating it in your mind, mentally tasting it. So when you do go to eat it, it's not as intense of a flavor kind of interesting. Now, taste receptors are found inside the taste buds, and the taste buds are in the papilla. And the taste buds, which you might have five to a hundred in some different parts of the body, have around 40 to 100 receptor cells and supporting cells in there. Now, these cells that are supporting cells, they can help replace and things like that. But the gustatory cell, what it's actually going to do is it's going to be the thing that actually does perceive the taste. So here, like if you were to drink a glass of wine and the chemicals of the wine go over this gustatory epithelial cell and this guy is fired uh, when the stimulus is on there, that's why you got to let it wash over and you'll find too that um, the uh, uh, for certain tastes um, they are they're not uh, excitable by any other thing um, which is very important is you know this it's called uh, if you remember my AMP one lecture I talked about what was called uh, a labeled line uh, the label line principle that this uh, taste receptor here, uh, when it's attached to a neuron, that neuron only carries taste information and nothing else. So you could follow that neuron and label that line, that neuron, all the way to the CNS, and that's all it would carry is what this thing says. It's a labeled line. You have uh, the sensory neurons that are attached to a receptor only carry what that receptor says, and they're not sensitive to any other type of stimulus. You can't see with the tongue. Okay. Now, to do this, let's see if my drawings will work again. It is always a pain in the booty. Now, uh, what I want to try to do is if we were to look at the tongue here. The tongue is monitored by three nerves. Now, because the stuff is so slow, it's going to take me a long time to get that in here. Now... Cranial nerve number seven, cranial nerve number nine, and then ten in the back. So nine does the front two thirds, seven does the front two thirds, the back third of the tongue is nine, and the pharynx is ten. 
Now let's see how long it takes for this to actually catch up to what I've drawn. Still not there yet. <laughs> how bad is this internet connection here? Barely a bar. <clears throat> Which is going to make things very fun when I really rely on this uh, to be able to do. But it's going to give me alerts from from every single YouTube channel. But it's not going to get this. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so what we're going to see is your facial nerve. Uh, cranial number seven does the anterior two-thirds. Then the glossopharyngeal number nine does the back third. And the vagus does things that's in like the glottis pharyngeal area. Glottis is in the pharynx. Now, uh, they carry information to your temporal lobe. I don't know if this is going to show up or not. I, uh, I've done so much since then. So, my drawing that I'm doing probably will not work. And I hope, um, I may, uh, hopefully by the time I get to the ear, uh, some of the drawings I'm going to need to do, I may have to upload this recording, come back and do it again to make it work. Okay, let's see what happens. So now there are four primary tastes, and then there's two other we don't know as much about. Now the four primary tastes is what they're going to be doing is there are things like sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Now, sweet and salty, sour and bitter. Now, sour and bitter are very different things. Sour is like vinegar. Bitter is like soap. Sweet, we know sweet and salty. Now, you can combine these two things and get both tastes. I love sweet and salty together. Um, and I know I like uh, umami and salty uh, together. I don't know if you guys have ever had, uh, now, one of my sweet and umami, uh, things like that, and salty. Uh, one of my favorite things is uh, it's, uh, it's a mix of cheddar cheese popcorn and caramel corn together. Now, so sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami is savory, savory flavors. Think of that as basically like uh, Parmesan cheese, stuff like that. And then there is water. Water does have a taste. Now, we know that mostly the taste of water is based on what's in the water, but water, there are taste receptors for water. The body does know you're getting water and you need to try to get water. It still isn't working. I'm going to close that down, and hopefully if I re do this, my hope is I have to keep trying to get this thing to work. It is a pain. Well, there we go. Let's back up again. Okay, so it's going to be very slow. Uh, but this was the drawing that I was doing. Uh, if it will show up, I don't know. Um, very frustrating. There we go. So this is what I was trying to do. Okay. Uh, now these tastes, they all go uh, either through 7, 9, and 10. Now 7, 9, and 10 we know uh, is parasympathetic uh, cranial nerves as well. They contain parasympathetic uh, motor uh, information for it too. So they are both sensory and motor nerves. We should know that. Uh, 3, 7, 9, and 10. So don't forget 3, 7, 9, and 10. Now uh, 7, 9, and 10 are also sensory for taste. Uh, number 1 for smell, 2 for the eye, 7, 9, and 10 for taste. Now there is a difference here. We actually have flavor. Now I also like to kind of say this. They Another way of saying this between gustation and olfaction is to say this simply is that both of these sensors uh, can be stimulated by very similar things. Now, let me give you a great example of this. When you're driving by on a highway and you see a dead skunk and you smell that dead skunk, you smell that skunk stink, I bet you taste it too. And you will see that uh, the gustatory and olfactory receptors act in a very similar way, binding to chemicals. So what it is really telling us about is something called flavor, a distinctive quality of food and drink, that they have flavors. 
that is um, a combination of gustation and olfaction. So, for example, when you drink coffee, when I have my morning coffee, and I, like now, you can probably tell I'm a little nasally, a little stuffed up. My coffee didn't taste as good this morning as it did before I got sick. And that's because uh, as it vaporizes over my tongue and goes up into the nasal cavities, it does that. Uh, same thing with a nice, rich beer. Uh, when you drink it, you let those after vapors travel up, things like that. And this is why, uh, uh, though the gustatory receptors are functioning, the olfactory receptors are not getting stimulated, so nothing doesn't taste as good. It just doesn't. And this is the link between gustation and olfaction, is it's telling me about flavor. All right. Now, uh, as we go into the ear, uh, this is the part where things tend to be a little bit more interesting. And uh, I'm hoping... That right now I've got a better. Ah, it just lost the connection again. Uh, it keeps kind of coming like partially in, partially out. I have a very poor internet connection in this office, so I'm hoping that. When I scream, mirror. It will pull up something and it will continue to work. Now, uh, what we're going to do is try to get the ear done and then call this first lecture complete. Now, this is something from lab. You're going to see that the ear has three distinctive anatomical regions. There's what's called the external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. Now, each of these do different things. They have different functions. Now, the external ear is really about collecting sound waves. Middle ear is about basically amplifying those things. And inner ear is about turning any information into equilibrium and hearing. It's about taking the sound waves that we've collected and amplified and turn it into something I can understand in the brain. Or my head's movement and tell me where my body is. Give me balance and hearing. Okay. External ear is what's visible. What you will see is it's the part that collects and then directs sound waves towards an eardrum or tympanic membrane. The middle ear, that's the part that's inside the skull in the temporal bone. It's found within an area called the petrous portion. Remember, petrous portion is where you're going to find in the temporal bone. That was where we found in lab. That's where you could see the internal acoustic meatus. And then as, it, uh, as these things amplify it and transmit it to the right part of the inner ear, it's going to use your ear bones we're going to see. Then the inner ear is going to have the sense organs. It's going to have things for equilibrium or balance and hearing. Okay, so let's take a look at these individually. So we're going to start here. You can actually see the outer ear containing things like your auricle and external acoustic meatus. We could see the middle ear here holding things like tympanic cavity, tympanic membrane separating the two uh, from each other, external and middle. We could see it holds the malus incus stapes, the auditory ossicles, uh, things like that. Then the internal ear is going to be holding things like your auditory tube, uh, which is associated mostly to the internal. Uh, so I mostly want to talk about the middle ear because it's attached to the middle ear uh, associated to that. And But here are inner ears mostly focusing on the cochlea and the vestibule, where is where our sensory receptors are. Now the external ear has an auricle, auricle being the ear flap. Uh, ear flap. This is the folds or penna where that collects, gathers up the sound waves that when sound waves come into the ear, they act like a funnel and funnel those sound waves and help drag them into the ear hole. The external acoustic meatus or external auditory canal. And that goes towards your tympanic membrane, just barely visible here. Inside this external acoustic meatus will be glands, very specialized sebaceous glands uh, and sweat glands called ceremonious glands that make your earwax. Ceremonious glands produce ceramin, the earwax, and at the end of this, separating the external ear from middle ear, will be your tympanic membrane or also called your eardrum. It's what separates it, but when sound waves hit it, they'll vibrate like the head of a drum when a drumstick hits it. Now, middle ear, 
what is going on in the middle ear. Well, right here we have the separation from external ear. Here we have the tympanic membrane and the middle ear. The middle ear, and we are going to talk about the auditory tube here, is the tympanic cavity is this hollow space inside behind the tympanic membrane. And what we're going to see going on here is, is you have uh, auditory ossicles located in here and then a tube called the auditory tube, pharyngotympanic tube, or eustachian tube. Now, pharyngotympanic tells us a lot. It tells me it goes from tympanic cavity to pharynx pharyngotympanic, from pharynx to tympanic cavity. This is the tube that allows you to pop your ears when your ears get stuffy and you yawn and your ears pop. It's because this tube opens up to the throat. Right here would be the uh, going into the just behind your nasal cavity. And it lets air in and equalizes pressure with the outside world. The auditory ossicles take vibrations from tympanic membrane and they send it to the inner ear. Now there is the hammer, the anvil, and the stape and the stapes, malus inca stapes, hammer, anvil, stirrup. And I do want to make the mention that the malus is attached to the tympanic membrane. It is one fused and attached to the tympanic membrane. The rest are just rattling together. Three little bones that rattle together. Uh, and then there are two muscles associated here, the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle. Now, both of these are basically safety mechanisms to try to prevent intense sound from blowing out the ear. How does that work? Well, when you are about to yell really loudly, your body sends a subconscious mechanism to these muscles to contract them. And one of these is tensor tympani. Tensor tympani. Tenses tympanic membrane, tensor tympani. It attaches itself, inserts onto the malus, and when it pulls and tightens on that, it pulls and tenses the tympanic membrane so the mem tympanic membrane can't move, reducing its movement so that a loud sound doesn't blow it out. Now you have to anticipate that loud sound. And it's controlled by a nerve called the trigeminal, tensor tympani trigeminal, TTT, tensor tympani trigeminal. Stapedius, stapedius is the facial nerve, controlled by facial nerve, uh, stapedius facial nerve, stapedius is the facial nerve, it's on the stapes and reduces the movement of stapes. Now, stapes is kind of like a toilet plunger on the inner ear, and it vibrates in and out, sloshing the inner ear around, creating pressure in it. Or think about the stapes as like a little kid, a young kid, a toddler or something, and you've taken them to Target, and they're going by the toys, and they're like, I want whatever toy, whatever toy they're into at the time. I want a Star Wars figure. I want a Star Wars figure. And they hop up and down and throw a fit. And mama has to, or daddy has to grab them. They get a hold of them by the shoulder and says, no, you sit still. You calm down. Well, the stapedius muscles, mama and daddy. The little st uh, stay piece is the baby kind of jumping up and down, throwing a fit, the little kid. And the stapedius muscle grabs it and reduces its movement so it's not sloshing the fluid to the inner ear around. Around, reducing the intensity of sound. Now, the facial nerve controls it. Now, one of the ways I remember that stapedius does facial nerve is I, if, if you want somebody to stop talking, you might think you might text them, uh, and or if you were to say text language, we would say STFU. We all know what STFU is. Um, shut the up, but uh, the uh, so stapedius is facial, stapedius, S T, facial, U, <laughs> uh, S T F U. Uh, that's how sometimes I remember that it's facial nerve. Now, not trying to be crass or, or rude there, but anything that can help it stick into your head because you have a lot of information and they're going to ask you things on departmental final, like what nerve controls that, and I'm going to ask you that too, um, lecture and lab. So uh, you'll probably see these some. <clears throat> All right, auditory ossicles. And you can see they're very small bones, some allocincus and stapes, and how they fit in here. Now, the inner ear. Now, what I want to start off with, with inner ear. Let's see how well this works, if it works. This is a drawing I've been doing for years with my students. 
So if it doesn't work, I'm probably going to come back and try it again. Now, really quickly, if this does not work, I do want to show you something. If you guys go to YouTube, and let me go into here and switch account and go here. If you find this YouTube channel, Myelin Nation, uh, this is my personal YouTube channel. I do have these drawings and stuff like that here as well, and some drawings that I'll do. You have to spell it like this, but I urge you to go to it. It'll be it, it'll be under content and things like that. I'll also talk about when I do my personal intro video, but I'm going to try to do this guy here with us. But I urge you to go to my YouTube channel. Now, as well, let's take a circle here and let's draw another. Oop. Hopefully, my tube in a tube will work. If it doesn't work, well, it's all right. We'll just survive. Uh, I don't know how slow this is going to be. So I probably will have to try to um, uh, force this to work the way the old-fashioned way. Uh, hopefully, I can get a better internet connection in another day. Okay, so what we want to see is imagine you have a tube in a tube. Your inner ear is like a tube in a tube, tube in a tube. There are two different portions of the inner ear. Now, the inner ear is where the receptors are for hearing and balance, equilibrium and hearing. Now, to get those, you have the outer bony layer called the bony labyrinth and then a softer internal membranous labyrinth here. Now, we're going to talk more about those in a minute. Now, the bony labyrinth that we want to talk about first here, uh, and I really kind of wish I went like inner ear bony labyrinth, things like that, but I'm going, um, I'll do that later on, is the bony labyrinth is bony, all this white material here, surrounding the blue internal membranous labyrinth, protects it. Now, the bony labyrinth has got semicircular canals, which surround the ducts. The ducts are the blue, the canals are the whitish material. The vestibule is this area here surrounding what we call the utricle and the saccule. Utricle and saccule. Utricle, saccule. Okay. Cochlea is the part that looks like a snail shell. Now, inside this fluid, you will find a, fl a fluid inside the bony labyrinth called perilymph. Perilymph is the fluid located in the bony labyrinth. Then we will see that that perilymph, uh, which is open here, has some openings to it called windows, oval and round window. Now, let's see if my drawing here is called up. Oval and round window. Oval window, round window. And what I'm going to do is write oval window. And round window here. And whenever it works, it works. There we go. Here we have our bony labyrinth. Here we have our membranous. Labyrinth. Excellent. Okay. Now, bony labyrinth, remember, has peri, lymph, and if you're not drawing with me, please do. And this membranous labyrinth is going to, we're going to see has endolymph. Now I'm going to assume you've already seen lab when you're looking at this. Okay, so the round window is going to have the stapes attached to it. So what we want to do here real quick is to draw my toilet plunger stapes. The stapes, like a toilet plunger, sits on the oval window. Okay, now 
the round window and the oval window are openings in the bony labyrinth. And what they do is the oval window, when the stay piece moves, bear in mind stay piece is a little bit like a toilet plunger moving in and out of the hole in the toilet to break up a clog, sloshing the fluid in there. Or think of it like a little kid who's jumping up and down, throwing a fit. And that movement creates pressure waves inside what is called the scala vestibule. Now, what I'm going to do for simplicity, scala vestibule, we're going to call this the vestibular duct. Another name for that is scala vestibule. And pressure waves are created in here by movement of the stapes in and out, creating pressure waves here. These pressure waves continue on through here, and they end up on what is called the scala tympani, or also called the tympanic duct. Okay. So what we're going to see is round window prevents those pressure waves dissipating them so we prevent auditory echoes. If you ever get a condition where the round window calcifies, you get auditory echoes. Uh, everything will sound like an echo, 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 echo. Now, membranous labyrinth, what that is, guys, is uh, the very soft stuff filled with endolymph, the tubes and sacs and chambers found inside the bony labyrinth, referred to as the membranous labyrinth, holding endolymph. Now, the vestibular complex is part of this. And what the vestibular complex is, is you're going to have the vestibule and the semicircular canals and ducts, rather. Semicircular ducts and these areas of the vestibule. Now, the vestibular complex has inside here a utricle and saccule. Utricle and saccule. Now the utricle and the saccule, utricle and saccule have these little things in it we're going to talk about. Now the utricle and saccule are part of the membranous labyrinth and they're in the vestibule itself. Then the other part of the vestibular complex is going to be your semicircular ducts and they do they're inside the canals we're going to talk about what they do then inside the cochlea is a cochlear duct wrapping around the cochlea now what i want to do here is if i were to go in here and say cochlear duct then we would know that this is a cochlea Okay, sorry, it's a little harder to draw on my iPad uh, than it would be on a board, but at least you are going to be able to get the drawings that I do in a little bit more time. Actually, I can go slower and give a little bit more explanation. Now, this cochlear duct is membranous labyrinth in the cochlea. Now, when we talked about the vestibular complex, we said that inside here was a utricle and saccule. Now, the utricle and saccule here, uh, what they have is uh, they are sacs, and they have a thing in it called a macula. Here's a macula. Here's a macula. The macula is a gravity and linear acceleration detector. It is a specialized receptor organ who is there to detect gravity and linear acceleration. What do we mean? Up from down and forwards from backwards and how fast am I going? It lets me know up from down gravity and linear acceleration. What direction am I going and how fast am I going? To do that, we need this organ called a macula, little tiny little organ, specialized organ for this a sensation called a macula, and they're located in the utricle and the saccule. Now, these guys are a little bit like a uh, um, like an old timey waterbed with rocks on it. So we have these hair cells that are going to stick their little cilia up into the gelatinous bed.
So imagine you've got all these little, like, if you had jello and you were to stick your fingers up into jello and then wiggle the jello, you would feel the jello wiggling with your fingers. That's what's happening here. This gelatinous material, as it wiggles, it bends these little finger like tips called kinocilium and stereocilia. There is one long kinocilium, kind of long. And the rest are stereocilia, and there's usually 80 to 100 of those, more like microvilli. They're mechanoceptors, which means distorting and bending them will stimulate them or inhibit them. When they bend, they're like light switches. They bend one way, it's, if it goes in one direction, it's on, it goes the other direction, it's off on or off, on or off. When you bend it that way or that way, it's on or off, depending on their orientation. Now, these peachy pink cells, called the uh, supporting cells, hold these guys up and orient them. And this membrane of gelatinous material is called the otolithic membrane. The otolithic membrane then has otoliths, that are the granules called sataconia or ear stones. And they're calcium carbonate crystals that pile on top and they accentuate movement. If you ever see someone come into an ear, nose, and throat doctor and they have vertigo and they're stumbling around and then they put them on a table, a tilt table, and it lifts them and drops them, lifts them, drops them, lifts them, drops them, and then they get up and walk fine. And you're like, witchcraft. So witch doctor, I tell you. Well, what's happening actually is you're shaking the sataconia back into place, these granules. And they got out of place, maybe to somebody hit their head a little bit, infection, things like that. And they got displaced, and you can put them back into place by doing that. Now, the semicircular ducts, I will ask you what they do. Which ones do head tilt, head, rotational motion, or vertical head movement? Now, the thing is, that's very important to kind of understand is we put the things for balance in the head because wherever our head is, our rest of our body tends to go because you can't survive being decapitated. So uh, the semicircular canals surround the ducts and the ducts help contain sensory receptors, we're going to talk about them in a minute, who give us rotational movement of a head. So wherever the head's rotating, the rest of the body is going with it, unless you're dead. Now, there is an anterior one. Anterior does yes motion. Shake your head yes, or do a front flip or a back flip. And that's anterior semicircular duct. Posterior does head tilt. What is head tilt? Head tilt is moving your head side to side, like, I don't know, I don't know, bobbing your head side to side like you don't know, uh, bobbing your head to your favorite music, side to side, uh, lateral flexion. Lateral does rotational head motion, like spinning like a top, when you go, no, no, when you shake your head, no, that's lateral semicircular duct. Now, that would be like spinning like a top. Now, posterior head tilt, that would be doing cartwheels or me spinning you like a propeller. Lateral, that would be like spinning like a top. That's what gets fired when you guys do the, if you've ever played uh, Pin the Tail on the Donkey or one of those games where you spin, uh, you spin around and around and around in a circle, then try to walk a straight line and do something you can't because the lateral semicircular duct is still firing. This is also the guy who's responsible for your eyes twitching when you're intoxicated. Why people's eyes move medially when intoxicated uh, is the lateral semicircular duct. It actually controls the eye movement. I do have a video that displays how all that works, but uh, that's something that you do not have to know. That's a much more complex neuro pathway that I did for some advanced students who'd asked me to do it. It's actually my most popular video, surprisingly. Now, how do we know which way that we're doing front flips, back flips, front flips and back flips? How do we know if we're doing cartwheels? How do we know if we're spinning like a top? Well, each of those ducts, semicircular ducts, have a receptor at the bottom called an ampulla. The ampulla is this thing here. 
And the capula is this little gelatinous thing on it. I like to think of those. You remember those little beanbag puncher things? Back when I was a kid, they were called weebles. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. When they still have these things, you blow them up, you inflate them, and they have sand on the bottom. You punch them, and they wobble, but they sit right back up. Well, that's what this guy does. When the fluid endolymph pushes on it, it can bend it that way or bend it that way. And these hairs bend, and it bends those hairs like a light switch on or off, depending on which way you bend it. Now, the crista is the part that holds the hair cells up. The hair cells are mechanoceptors, and they're sensitive to movement of capula. When capula bends, it distorts that uh, hair cell and tells me I'm moving, tells me that I've rotated a particular direction. And uh, that's a very interesting thing there. So uh, I hope we can see that. Now, uh, the inner ear, we now see the ampulla. We talked about its structure. The ampulla, when it bends, tells me which direction. It bends the ampulla direct uh, to its uh, it's uh, where you're moving, where the body moves. So if my body goes that way, the ampulla bends with the uh, rotational motion. So if we go that way, the ampulla bends opposite, and it either turns on or turns off these hair cells. And these hair cells alter the relate of neurotransmitter release. If you release more neurotransmitters, we know we're going one direction. For example, if you bend it towards the kinocilium, that stimulates it. If you bend it away from the kinocilium, it inhibits it. And this is the on-off switch. Bend it that way, and you turn it off, and you no longer get information from that one, uh, but others are being fired. It tells you precisely which plane you're going in. Now, it does three-dimensional planes, X, Y, and Z. And that's what you got here, X, Y, Z coordinate. Okay. Now, hair cells in the vestibule, they do gravity and linear acceleration. Semicircular ducts do rotational motions. Am I rotating uh, in a direction? And the cochlea has hair cells, and it only does sound. So each of these guys, though they are mechanoceptors, though they work in a very similar method, they are telling me about gravity, acceleration, or rotational motion, or sound, if it's in the vestibule, semicircular ducts, or the cochlea. So they all work on the same principle of distorting the stereocilia, altering the release of neurotransmitters, acting like on-off switches. Okay? Now, in the macula, and these are something they like to ask in departmental finals, is the utricle and the saccule both have a macula. There's a macula in the utricle, and a macula in the saccule. Now, when the head moves, uh, the granules pull and distort the static, uh, the uh, otolithic membrane, the jelly, and that bends the hair cells. And when the hair cells bend, that stimulates them. If they're not being stimulated, that tells me something. If they are being stimulated, it tells me something. Okay. So either thing, on or off, is still something it's telling me. Now, the macula, the utricle, does what we say, guys, horizontal movement. Now, when you lay horizontally in the bed, you might drool. You trickle. You trickle when you lay down horizontally in the bed to sleep. Horizontal movement, linear acceleration, is done by the utricle. Saccule does vertical movement, gravitational pull. Think about a sack. Needs to be kept vertically so the contents don't fall out. Saccule does vertical movement, gravitational pull. This tells me up from down. Your saccule, the macula of the saccule does gra gravity. The macula of the utricle does linear acceleration. Okay? Pay attention to those because you will see those, especially like even departmental final, even myself. I'm going to ask you things like that. Okay? Now, uh, let's talk about the pathway and how information gets to the brain that I felt equilibrium. Well, here I am in my vestibule, and I've stimulated a macula. I stimulated a ampulla, something like that. And then we are going to go into what is called the vestibular nerve. 
vestibular nerve then unites with the cochlear nerve to form vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight, and that goes into the brain. When it goes into the brain, uh, that information will go essentially to the cerebellum, to the cerebral cortex, or it also goes down to uh, vestibulospinal tracts, if you remember that from AMP1. Vestibulospinal uh, tracts is what alters muscle activity. This allows you to become, like, uh, based on how you move, to make certain muscles tighten and certain muscles relax, things like that. All right, so we've drawn our cochlea. And once I do the hearing process, an auditory pathway, I'll stop. But this drawing here, I hope that you practice it many times. That's what it's going to take to get these in your head. Uh, practice does not make perfect. Practice makes prepared, and chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, practice it as many times as you can so that you know how it all fits together. Because the hardest part about these things is what is in what? Where is it? It becomes like this nested, those Russian nested dolls where this is inside this, and this is inside this, and this is inside this bigger thing then you got this big thing with all these other little things in it and it's very hard to tease all that out without really drawing it out and doing this stuff okay so this is the way that i do that now the cochlea remember surrounds cochlear duct this is part of the inner ear there is a scale of vestibule which we've drawn on our diagram this is what conducts uh pressure from your oval window from by the stapes and there's perilymph then we saw the tympanic duct, also called the scale of tympani, and the round window dissipates that pressure wave, and that's got perilymph in it. So what's between these two here is our cochlear duct between them, and this is where the rubber meets the road for sound. The cochlear duct is where the sense of hearing can be produced, and the cochlear duct producing the what we would know as hearing is found between the scala tympani and the scala vestibule, or vestibular duct and tympanic duct. Now, there are two major membranes and then a third smaller membrane. The two big ones, one is the floor, the basilar membrane, is going to separate cochlear duct from tympanic duct. And then the other one is the roof. Now, the v, uh, the letter V, V, looks like a roof upside down. Vestibular membrane is the roof of the cochlear duct. Basilar membrane is the floor of the cochlear duct. Vestibular separates cochlear duct from vestibular duct, vestibular membrane. Basilar membrane separates cochlear duct from tympanic duct. Okay, now uh, what happens here is the basilar membrane associated just above that is a thing called the tectorial membrane. And tectorial membrane is covering up hair cells. And that is what makes up our spiral organ of organ of corti, we call it. Spiral organ or Organ of corti is where the hair cells in the cochlear duct are located. Now, these hair cells are activated by movement. How do we get movement? Well, the stereocilia, when they are moved and distorted, they are done so by the tectorial membrane as fluid passes by them. It moves the tectorial membrane, causing the tectorial membrane and the basilar membrane to collide with each other, causing the hair cells to be moved, causing stereocilia to distort, and things like that. Now, there are no kinocilium here, only stereo. Stereo, you hear in stereo. Stereocilia only in the organ of corti. And the supporting cells just hold them up. Now, let me show you what's going on here. So if I were to go into my cochlea and I went into my vestibular duct, cochlear duct, tympanic duct, and I were to look at the cochlear duct and zoom in, I would see my basilar membrane here, 
Here is my vestibular membrane. And the tectorial membrane overlying basilar membrane, these supporting cells hold up these various hair cells. And these hair cells will collide and vibrate onto the tectorial membrane. And this acts a little bit like an old-timey telegraph. When pressure flows from the vestibular duct around and then out to the tympanic duct, when it flows around these, it moves this in-between duct, causing collisions and vibrations that are going to be turned into sound. Okay. Now, now that we've produced it, and I'm going to go over the whole hearing process, but we've got to first understand something called wavelength. What is wavelength? We've got to understand what sound really is. Sound is complicated. It's a pressure wave out there that my body has produced. And if I were to make a noise and uh, like, ooh, ooh, and map that, I might see oscillations of the sound that I made. There will be oscillations of that. Uh, and the form of a wave. And these two crests of the wave have a distance called the wave length. It is the distance between two crests of a sound wave. Because sound exists as a wave, a wave-like S-shaped pattern, and two crests, the distance between those is wave length. Now, if how many waves there are at a given time per second or a millisecond is the frequency. And our measure of wavelength is called cycles. Our measurement of frequency, how many cycles per minute, that's hertz. Pitch is how I perceive that frequency. So frequency is how fast it comes at me. Wavelength is a distance. Now, uh, you might be thinking, short wavelength, high frequency. Long wavelength, low frequency. Pitch is our perception of it. So somebody is pitch perfect, has perfect pitch, that is only based on your perception. I may not think that. I may think they sound horrible. Um, amplitude is how much energy. And we measure that in decibels as our measurement. So here you can see uh, the air waves here, distortion of air molecules producing wavelengths. Wavelengths, here we have one wavelength, the amplitude, how intensity, how much intensity it is, the frequency, how many waves there are in a particular amount of time, cycles per second, and hertz, how we might report that. Uh, now, the more amplitude, the louder it is. Something like a jackhammer or a gunshot has extremely strong amplitude. Uh, things like that, very low, low amplitude things might be harder to hear, especially with age. So we start off everything by taking our tympanic membrane and vibrating it. A sound wave at a particular wavelength strikes the tympanic membrane strikes it, makes it vibrate. When it vibrates and move, and as it moves, you're rattling your ear bones, your auditory ossicles, malus incisus get displaced. Basically, tympanic membrane moves, rattles your ear bones together. And then the stapes is the last one to vibrate. And that produces pressure waves of the perilymph and vestibular duct. As vestibular duct gets pressure waves in it here, that pressure wave then comes by the basilar membrane here and wavies it, and that will make your uh, that will make the hair cells collide and vibrate against the tectorial membrane, and that acts like an old timey telegraph. And then uh, once it gets to the brain. Uh, the information about in region and intensity gets to the cochlear branch, vestibular cochlear nerve uh, to get to the brain to be made understood of it. So now, for example, if it's a very intense sound, you might have a lot more of the cochlea involved. If it's very quiet, very little of the cochlea involved. So the sound waves, first thing they do 
is they displace, they strike your uh, um, tympanic membrane. Then as the tympanic membrane vibrates, they dissipate, distort auditory ossicles. At the oval window, the stapes dissipates and transmits pressure waves into the vestibular uh, membrane, vestibular duct. That then goes to the tympanic duct, and as it does it, it distorts the basilar membrane, stimulating that region of cochlear duct, to, and then goes to the cochlear nerve to let me know I've heard it. So basically here, red, tympanic membrane. Malus, incus, and stapes get rattled. When the stapes rattles at the oval window here in green, it causes pressure to accumulate inside the vestibular duct, and that will then, as it passes down into the tympanic duct, it bends and distorts the tympanic membrane or the cochlear uh, cochlear duct here, and that stimulates so that I can hear. Okay. That is how we hear, very mechanistically, okay? So review that process, because it will take some time to get it in there. The goal is, when you hear it in lecture, you can go, oh, I understand this. I've got a very basic idea how this works. Now, frequency is determined by where in the cochlea. For example, uh, this would be like very high-pitched sounds. This is very low-pitched sounds. Justin Bieber squealing, uh, foghorn. Uh, because many hertz, uh, very high pitch, very low pitch. So where it is stimulated in the cochlea, and you can kind of see where my drawing came from now, uh, where it is stimulated gives you part of that information. Then the number of hair cells involved in stimulated is how I get my intensity, because that's how many signals I'm getting. So where in the cochlea does uh, frequency how much hair cells are stimulated tells me the intensity. So when I hear, what I've done is I've taken part of the cochlea, either low frequency or high frequency. Low frequency, all the way here, very deep and loud sounds. Here, very high pitch sounds, very squealy, squeaky sounds here. I can't do that very well. And that will go into the cochlear nerve, cochlear branch, vestibulo cochlear nerve, where it goes in the midbrain, then crosses over. That information travels up to the thalamus and it goes to an area called the medial geniculate nucleus. Medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. If you want to hear me, if you want to hear me, you need the medial geniculate nucleus. Medial geniculate nucleus to hear me. Then from there, we relay that information to the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. And then I will be aware of it. You will see this on the test. You will see the parts of the auditory pathway on this exam. I'm going to ask you guys this for sure. Okay. All right, this is where we're going to end our first lecture uh, for this chapter. Then I'll finish up with the I in the next chapter, uh, next lecture. So, guys, thank you so much for watching, and this concludes my lecture.